is going to be a quick unit um, review of um, the first unit in our textbook. I'm going to switch over here to, I have access to the online version of the textbook from our uh, publisher. Let's grab the table of contents and go down to the first chapter is unit, introduction to Scrum. Uh, so Scrum is a new modeling uh, well, a new development technique, and we'll be talking about that uh, in this unit. We're actually going to spend three uh, weeks, three units on this one chapter. Uh, this the first time we'll kind of review a bunch of stuff on Scrum, get through about half of this chapter. Uh, the second unit, second week, we'll spend on uh, actually reviewing stuff with C Sharp. I expect most of you don't know C Sharp and just Java. So we'll spend a week talking about the critical differences between C Sharp and Java and getting you up to speed with some stuff with C Sharp because uh, later chapters of this book will assume you know the basics of C Sharp. So we need to get you to that point. Uh, and then the third week we'll go over some more, more advanced uh, parts of this chapter. So let's talk a little bit about Scrum uh, and how it's set up. So the idea uh, of Scrum is it's an alternative to a traditional uh, development strategy. It's part of what is called the Agile family of lightweight development tools. Um, this is all relatively new. Uh, this Agile stuff was developed in about 2001. Uh, it was the first really writings. This manifesto, I think, was created then. Um, but really didn't it was you know gained popular slowly so 2004 and 5 it was gaining more popularity and scrum itself didn't come out until about 10 years ago uh and it's been growing uh since then so be aware that uh, a lot of people who are practicing scrum just haven't been using it how didn't ne never took a course on it most people who are developing it have had just a somewhere between a, a couple day tutorial on it or to uh, you know just watching a video on it or something like that so we'll put you at a little bit of advantage in going out in the workforce having had uh, a little more background in scrum and how it works so scrum is an alternative to the traditional waterfall method when i first uh... graduated from college and started doing development um, we used this methodology and to tell you the truth this methodology drove me to teaching it was just so awful and i hated my job so much i said i gotta get out of here and i went into teaching um, we would spend uh, i was working at at t bell labs and i was given about a one section of code that monitors traffic and displays traffic information uh, for some voice uh, stuff and it, I, it was about 200 pages of code I was in charge of and it was all done and then I, we were just you know had to do updates to it uh, add new features to it and so uh, we had to write we were given the ideas of what the features had to be and then we had to write requirements for those features uh, I write, write about a 200 page design document for those t features, I had to implement the code. But many times I was waiting for other design documents, waiting for uh, other designs to be done before I could finish parts of my design or implementation, waiting for someone else's code to finish before I could do my code. There's many times I went into work with absolutely nothing to do and uh, you may think that would be fun but for me it just drove me crazy to have to go in and, uh, two days in a row or three days in a row uh, and know I was just going to sit in my office and basically do nothing. I mean there are times uh, where if I had a whole week with nothing to do I could ask for a special project and assign that but uh, I just did not like this waterfall uh, methodology. So. Now there's other people, who, uh, especially within our own department, who love this methodology and follow it. Uh, so there's still debates on what the best methodology is. So uh, that's a constant issue of discussion, but that's okay. Uh, so Scrum is an agile methodology. So let's describe how it works. Um, you've probably seen some of this from uh, CS 3108, the System Analysis and Design class. So what we have is uh, we have a product. Uh, generally, it's already out there, and we're updating it. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of features that we need to add to that product. Uh, maybe fix this, add this, be able to do this, uh, create this. So we have this whole what's called a product backlog features and stories that want to be added to the stuff. We select the most important features or stories. Um, and we'll talk about what a story is in just a little bit. But just think of it as a feature. Um, and we select the most important ones and put them in what is called a sprint backlog. And we're just going to go through what is called a short sprint. 
uh, here. So then we spend about a week or two, sometimes as much as a month, but uh, often the, the like a two weeks is a common sprint amount. And what we'll do is grab features from this backlog, sprint backlog, and implement those into our um, the the product and test them out and get them working and then at the end of the sprint end of the two weeks uh we'll release a new version of the product with those new features and then we loop back up grab some uh new features the next set of features from the product that not need to be implemented put those in the sprint backlog and then we spend a week or two weeks implementing those features and then we have a new release so we have releases uh, often every week or every two weeks, depending on how often your sprints are. Now that compares to this waterfall method. When I was implementing this, we had a release every about nine months. It's not uncommon to have a release every year sometimes with this sort of process. So I know I worked at a one location for two years and was there for two releases during that time. So. Um, so again, read through this on the different parts of Scrum. I'll just highlight some different ideas. Uh, examples. Um, they talk about Scrum and different things, uh, some different uh, development techniques. Like I was just talking to one of my students who had done this Scrum and uh, Caban over the summer as an internship. Um, I was talking last uh, spring to one of our alumni who was out working and he's doing Scrum and TDD. Uh, test driven design now that's something he said everyone should learn or know about and it's not covered that well in this book it's just one of those added things so you might want to just google test driven design <laughs> test driven design and read a little bit about what test driven uh, design is um, and how it's set up. It's a common uh, method. You will see more of that when we get to, uh, to the quality assurance course that comes after this. Um, but w there you basically create a test uh, for each feature. The first thing you do is to create a test. Every story you create a test to, to show how that test, that feature is going to work. And then you design until that test succeeds. So you create the test first and then you implement it. And then you know if you're done if the test succeeds. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities. Um, there's always a product owner here. This is often someone like in management or something like that who owns a product. Now, depending on the type of product you have, this might vary. So if this is an external product, uh, like we have a company in town here, Sanzio, uh, that makes software for the healthcare industry. And they have a couple different product lines and in that they sell to their clients. And in each product line, they have a, a manager or a pro, an owner of that product line uh, for that. So uh, that's pretty clear. Now, more with internal stuff, like here at the College of St. Scholastica, we are running the, a banner system and we have like banner web that lets you interface with that. Uh, well, we do mess and maintain, although we bought that package from somewhere else, we do do updates and stuff to that. And so when we're updating that, we have uh, an owner, and that's from a department inside the college. It's not the IT department. Uh, often it's the registrar uh, who heads up the registration and student uh, department who's the technical owner for that is in kind of control of that product. So we have the owner uh, of it. We also have a scrum master. Uh, this is the kind of the project manager for a scrum team. Um, does a lot of the project management stuff. Uh, I just, I think that's a cool term, Scrum Master. Now you might wonder, is that a real term? So why don't you go out and search for Scrum Master and see if that's a real term out there. Um, and you, why don't you, you can just search for your state, say Scrum Master Wanted and look in your state and see if that's out there. Uh, if you're in Minnesota, uh, you can just go to Minnesota Works. Uh, dot net. I've created a new login for that uh, that's just cis at css.edu and the password is pa uh, student so I'm going to switch this to that cis at css.edu and student and log in and I'm going to switch for jobs I'll do statewide uh, here and we'll just search for scrum master 
and we see different scrum master jobs out there some of them are just in uh you know product owner but here's a lead scrum master here's a scrum master in minneapolis here's a scrum master and again these these are all in the last week uh scrum master jobs out there now you're not going to be able to get a scrum master job as a new developer these all should require um some experience uh on working uh things so maybe you know but, different amounts of experience working as a scrum master or in the scrum methodology so um, but again you can just google scrum master wanted and look at one of the uh, national websites to find scrum master jobs in your area just kind of interesting to see if they're actually out there okay let's talk about the development team um, itself so agile methodology is often looking for this generalized specialist uh, you may not have heard of that concept very much, so let's just kind of go over what that is. Uh, it means that uh, each, you, you don't want specialists that only know one thing. Uh, because again, when you're working through these small sprints, uh, you're often going to want to be able to work on different things at different times. So you want to be able to do general things, but you do want people to have some specialization. Sometimes I've heard this kind of described as a T uh, methodology where uh, you have a broad base, so you might have a broad base of skills, and then there will be one area where you go into depth on some areas. So maybe you know uh, a little bit of uh, JavaScript and a, a little bit of HTML and stuff, but you know a bunch of Java, uh, or maybe you you've done a lot of work in Android development or something like that. So your depth. So this is supposed to look like a T, so I've heard that uh, described. Now I often think more of a W, more like a, a icicle approach where you've got this broad brace and you have lots of different areas. And again, when you're working on your skill base, you can kind of imagine this. Where do you want depth at and where do you want uh, stuff at? So you need a broad base on lots of different technologies, but you want some uh, nice uh, depth also. So you want this mixture of... Uh, skill base. So maybe you know lots of Java programming and some Android development, uh, but you just know a little bit of JavaScript and a little bit of C Sharp. Uh, maybe you know some Scrum. Maybe you're pretty good at uh, SQL so and database uh, setups. So kind of imagine this sort of stuff or, you know, this sort of base. And this is what Agile is looking for people with a broad set of skills with some depth in different areas. So that's what they're talking about. This is this generalized specialist approach. Ah, uh, the pigs and the chickens. Uh, read through that chapter. Um, the whole analogy, and you've probably heard this before somewhere, you know, as if you're having a breakfast or starting a restaurant and you're serving uh, bacon and eggs. Uh, who's committed to that more, the pig or the chicken? Uh, so sometimes you have people who are just contributing to a project, uh, but not really. In it. One of our alumni, or one of my students in my face-to-face -face class, was just telling me over the summer she was more like a chicken because she was doing middleware development, and so on projects she was contributing to a couple different projects, but not really dedicated 100% to that project because she was just doing middleware for different projects. Uh, where another developer was in the project, and, you know, you might be in the project and a developer all the time in the project, you're fully committed to that project. So someone who's fully committed is a, a pig. If you're supplying the bacon to breakfast, you are fully committed to that project. So you may have heard that uh, analogy before. Now, artifacts are what we're going to be delivering, and one of the things about Agile is we have fewer deliverables or fewer artifacts for this. Uh, one of the purposes is we still are going to want to develop uh, requirements and do uh, analysis and that sort of stuff, but we're going to do them like kind of just in time, just rather than uh, figuring out what the requirements are and talking to users and trying to write this down and communicate it so that later, six months later on, we can go back and look at these and implement them. Uh, we're going to all of a sudden decide, oh, we're going to need this feature. I'm going to go talk to the user today, uh, figure out what the user needs, uh, make some notes on it, and implement it tomorrow. Uh, and then test it the next day. Um, the main artifact we're going to use is a scrum board. Uh, this is often a uh, whiteboard with post-its on it uh, that you move around. Uh, and so uh, features will start uh, written on these little post-its here. And then uh, at the, every day someone will say, oh, I'm going to implement this feature. They'll grab that post-it and put it in the work in progress area. 
Uh, when it's done, they'll often send it to Quality Assurance for testing. Now you do some testing, usually unit testing here in development, but then here you're going to be doing some kind of regression testing. Um, you're going to have a whole set of tests to make sure uh, your product is working in all sorts of ways, some automated tests, and then you're going to run these uh, changes through this regression test to make sure there's no issues with it. And then once uh, they're done with Quality Assurance, they're completely done over here. Uh, that works. Now, in your assignment, let's go back this week, you're going to have to read some of these things and answer some questions. So, like there's assignment on Scrum Board examples. So, why don't you look at that figure, uh, find your own figure for Scrum Board, a Scrum Board example, post the link here, and then uh, describe how it's different than how it's described in their text here. Uh, bonus points if you don't just go to Google Shirts and Google Scrum Boards and give something on the first page. I see those images all the time, so I would really like to see something on the second page even, or search for Scrum Board bad examples, or some Scrum Board health gear. I don't know, anything you want. Uh, just find a different Scrum Board if you want. So, Okay. Uh, so on scrum boards we have these post-its that are often called cards. Sometimes they are posts, I mean 3x5 cards, but often they're 3x5 post-it materials. And on there we're going to write some sto uh, user story and things like that. And we'll talk uh, more about what a user story is in just a sec. So here's how we break down it. Uh, we have our product. We break the product down into a release. A bunch, uh, and each release has a bunch of features in it. And each feature has a bunch of stories. And we actually kind of create this the other way around. We have a product and we have a bunch of things we want to do that product. We want to make these changes. Each change is going to be a story. We want to make this change and that story. And then we're going to put these stories together in a feature sometimes. Um, and then we're going to put features together. And we're going to do these set of features in a sprint and do it as a release. Uh, so we actually are putting together certain uh, cards and stuff here. Uh, for example, maybe you want your product to be able to to back up information. You want uh, users to be able to say, "I want to be able to back up uh, and select the day of the week I want to run backups." And now maybe you have another uh, thing story you want to add. I want to be able to back this up uh, over the internet to to, an, uh, to a cloud resource to Dropbox stuff like that. Uh, so maybe that'll be another story. And then maybe on a story, but I want to be able to share this data over uh, the cloud to different uh, social media things. So maybe there's a group of stories that you know involve backing up, backing up to the cloud, sending a backup date that you can group together in a feature uh, because they're all kind of related. And then you grab a couple of features and put it into a release. Go through, read this. Now, there's this term of a minimal, minimal viable release. So what you want to do is when you have a release, and this just drives me crazy, it probably drives you crazy too nowadays, uh, like on my smartphone, Android phone, every week I have apps updating themselves. They're releasing constantly, and you can, that's all driven by this Scrum stuff. Some of these things are releasing updates every two weeks or every month or something like that. So there's this whole concept of a minimal viable release, a release that you're going to send out to customers that have enough features that it's worthwhile for the customer to have to update it or run this. Uh, there's also a minimal marketable feature, and that's something that's actually useful to the customer, the end user. Uh, as, as you know, you can describe it to them that this is a feature. So, now your textbook uses this term feature. Now, Scrum often uh, other Scrum people will use the term epic a lot. Uh, the idea is that if you put a couple stories together, you make an epic, uh, you know, a large, a, a big story or a large thing. So often this thing is an epic, and epics go together. But some people find that confusing. So you're this text talks about features. So stories go together in each either epics or features, uh, and features and epics go together to make a release. So. Um, yeah, so here's user stories, and you should have seen this in SysNelson Design. Uh, there, as a some user, I want to do something so I can do it. So as an unauthenticated but registered user, I want to reset my password so I can log into the system and forget my if I forget my password. So short descriptions. Now this should not this is doesn't include all the requirements that required for this. It's just a short reminder. The uh, assumption is that the user who chooses this will get enough information to know what it is and then can go to the the end users, the people who are using this software, and talk to them and get the requirements down uh, at that time so that they can implement the features. 
uh, for it. So part of this is just a lead in to you going talking to users so that you can find out what needs to be done to implement those features. So. Uh, and then often these features are broken down further into tasks. Um, and that gets into this slicing stuff. Um, so each user story should what we be call be vertically sliced. So a v what that means is that um, rather than having a feature that just says implement a new field in the database, um, stories should start up at the user layer, something tethered to the user interface and work their way down and impact everything, you know, the middleware, the um, database integration, uh, all this sort of stuff. So they're often called deep uh, or vertically aligned uh, ideas, these stories. So every story, like I say, should be tied in. So we don't want to say, you know, we want to be able to back up uh, our data. It should be tied to, you know, as a user, I want to be able to set the day of the backup uh, so I can back up my you know the data regularly uh, so you want this part uh, the what I want to do should be tied to a user interface element and that should drive a lot you know uh, there should be a lot of stuff hidden under that so often we'll take a story and break it up in tasks well in order to get that work we've got to do this to the database we got to do this we got to do this and those are our different tasks that we break out of a story um, last thing we want to talk about is technical debt. And again, with user stories and technical debt, there are both of those are tied. There's a question here about technical debt where I want you to read about technical debt in our chapter and then compare that to this article on technical debt. And same with user stories, I want you to give an example of user story here. Uh, so technical debt is a cool idea. Um, it's been a I don't know, it's something that's been, we haven't been able to describe, but developers have known of its existence for a long time. Um, it's when you're coding, when you're developing software, sometimes you take shortcuts uh, to set things up that you know you're going to have to come back later and change, or most likely you're going to have to change, or you know someone's going to pay for this later on because you're taking these shortcuts. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. This summer, my son was developing a new game um, and programming a Smash Brothers, uh, Smash Brothers clone. And so when he, he wanted to get something out and working right away, so we hard coded a lot of positions on the screen for certain elements. And he knew that he was getting technical debt with that. He knew he was going to have to change that later on, but he just wanted to get it done quickly so that um, he could work out some other issues and once he got those other issues he was going to go back and redo this and set it up so it's much more adaptable to future levels. I think you've seen this before whenever you've done a project you, you know kind of think if you if you do one example of it uh, one level one user one uh, sample um, and then you want to do a second one uh, sometimes when you add the second one, it takes two or three times as much time as the first one because you have to go back to the first one and redo it so it's more generic so that you can add a second element or a second thing to this. Other times, if it's done well the first time, adding it, a, adding a second option is really clean and stuff like that. So we'll be talking a lot about ways of developing stuff so that uh, you, you don't necessarily incur technical debt. But again, sometimes you have to incur technical debt. And so it goes over some different types of technical debt here. I want you to read through that and that'll be part of this week's questions and that sort of stuff. Um, now last thing we want to go over is the definition of done. When something, when a user story is done, what does that mean? Uh, so here's a, a good example of what done is. Um, it means all the unit uh, tests on the code have succeeded. Uh, the code has been committed uh, to this continuator integration builds and runs without errors, passing all tests. Uh, as I mentioned, this regression stuff, often we have a set of tests that tests uh, our product and how it integrates uh, everything. So we, we make these changes. Often we're checking out code for source control. Uh, you're making some modifications and you're checking it into your um, 
your scrum, your your sprint stuff, and then at the end of the week you're checking it into this a larger build and regression tests. These tests are run against to make sure it's not breaking anything else. So that's part of the QA part of this process, um, this quality assurance. And again, then you're you should have some acceptance criteria. Some it might be a little test. It might be something else that you may wrote down on your story card that's from the product owner. Well, you know, when I'm done with this, I should be able to do this, uh, and and it's clear behavior that you should be able to do. Uh, the code should be peer reviewed by someone who didn't work on this story. Uh, now, if you're doing pair program, often you do pair programming with Scrum. Then two people have looked at the code, and often you don't have to do peer review. If you're the only one who's coded it, then you need to. F uh, most companies have peer review process they go through. Uh, you have to document it enough, and you have to make sure that you didn't do any reckless uh, technical debt. You didn't do a cheap, dirty way to do this. It's someone's going to have to pay. Again, there's some good times, some place you have to do technical debt. Uh, later on, uh, but it's a good start. Um, so the idea is that you know sometimes, and we'll talk about something called refactoring. Sometimes with technical debt, you'll know you have to go back and refactor code, uh, reorganize code so that it's it's structured better, but does the same functionality. And that we use the term technical debt actually to kind of communicate this restructuring, refactoring a code up to managers of projects so they can understand what you're doing, that there's the idea of technical debt. And I think we've all seen issues with technical debt products where they've become so cumbersome that to add new features uh, is just so complicated. I've even seen students who are working in Java 1 projects uh, and code where uh, they do it in such a weird way with so many weird variables set up that just to add a little bit of new features to, to, to work on a little bit more, it's become so complicated they can't figure out. And But certainly there are large projects out there that have code has become so complicated they've incurred so much technical debt that they just can't really add features to that product anymore with because it's, it's so complicated interwoven. So that's what we want to avoid, and at times what we want to do is spend some time paying down the technical get going back and refactoring code, and we'll talk about ways of doing that in this class. Okay, the rest of the chapter is on more advanced topics. We talk about this burn down uh, story points and charting these down and uh, sprint burn down, how that works. Um, we'll talk about some examples, and so we're going to save that for future weeks uh, of this course. So we're just going to end uh, this introduction here. Hope you enjoyed it.